Welcome back folks, uh, we're going to move into chapter 4 uh, in this recording and first thing we're going to look at are um, limitations on cell size. As always, we're not going to go into every single uh, aspect of this chapter. Uh, the learning outcomes can guide you to the important things that you need to know for assessment and you should probably read holistically so you get the big picture on, on the topics we're talking about. So, so what we're going to look at um, to start with, because I think this will be new, um, or at least only previously touched on uh, in some small way, is the limitations that cells have on size. So we're going to address the question of why can't cells be giant cells? Why aren't we overwhelmed by giant roaming amoeba, for example? So there are three reasons that we can we can explore regarding the limitations on cell size. Before we do that, let's just think about cells. Cells come in a variety of, of sizes and shapes. You see these characteristic cells drawn in textbooks, and it's a little bit misleading. You think cells all have the same kind of anatomy and morphology, huge diversity in the cells that, that, that we find um, in, in, uh, in our bodies and in the ecosystems, ranging from um, simple bacteria up to uh, larger bacterial aggregates in some places, uh, simple protozoa like amoebas, and then, you know, uh, colonial algae like volvox, moving up through the complexity of the fungus uh, into uh, uh, complex higher plant tissues, um, and obviously the, the complexity we see in animal cells with a variety of different functions. So we got a whole range of sizes and shapes. Thinking about bacteria, smallest bacteria about 0.2 to 0.3 micrometers in diameter. Those are, those are called the nanobacteria. Um, but then the extreme end of the spectrum, we've got nerve cells, which could be anything up to a meter long. Some of these giant squid axons up to a meter long. Uh, think about the uh, neurons, the axons of the neurons that have to run down the back of a giraffe's neck. Um, those can be incredibly long before they synapse together in chains. Um, so, but despite those kind of extremes on each end of the spectrum, um, cells tend to fall into a predictable size range. So bacteria, they're normally like one micrometer to five micrometers in length. E. coli standard bacteria is about two micrometers in length. Um, eukaryotic cells, animal cells specifically here, they're ranging about 10 to 100 micrometers. So um, uh, a mammalian egg uh, in humans. Uh, it's about 100 micrometers, uh, 0.1 to 1 millimeter in length. But then there are some larger animal cells, frog eggs, for example. They can be significantly larger. So generally, cells are pretty small, and we need microscopes to to, to uh, examine them structurally. Um, and we talked about microscopy before, so we won't need to get back into that. Let's go back to these three limitations on cell size. First of all, you can't get bigger than a certain size of your cell because you have to maintain an adequate surface area to volume relationship. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So there's a ratio between the surface area, that's obviously the surface, the, the plasma membrane surface, um, a ratio between the surface area and the volume. You've got to maintain that sufficiently high, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Second, um, the rates of molecular diffusion. How quickly molecules can move around in a cell. Um, if it's going to take them 40 minutes to get from one side of the cell to another side of the cell because the cell is so large, then biochemistry doesn't work. Second thing is, we have to have cells that, which are sufficiently small in many cases so that you can locally concentrate um, uh, substrates for uh, biochemical reactions so that reactions can actually occur in a meaningful time frame. Now you carry out to overcome this a little bit by making organelles so that, that, that helps a little bit by confining certain reactions and certain substrates for those reactions into, into smaller volumes within the cell. Um, so let's explore this first one, the need to maintain a high surface area to volume ratio. So this is usually the, the major restricting limit on cell size. You've got to maintain an adequate surface area volume ratio. This is important because there are exchanges between the cell and its surroundings. Now you can think about that as in a nutrient exchange or diffusion of gases, that kind of thing. There's also an exchange of information. And if you don't have a sufficiently high surface area, then you can't officially exchange information. Now, if you get a surface area too big, then you mess up the surface area volume ratio for exchange of nutrients. So there is a kind of like a Goldilocks zone, I guess, in terms of surface area to volume ratio. Um, so if we think about a volume of a cell increasing, um, as the volume of a cell increases, um, uh, the volume actually increases with the cube of the length. So think about a cube, to be honest, with three dimensions, x, y, and z. If we uh, double 
the, uh, the, 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 the length of a side of a cube, then the volume in cubes increases as a cube function of that. So um, you get a much greater volume with not a significant increase in surface area because if you increase the surface area, then the surface area increases only with um, a twofold increase, so it's a doubling. So you don't get a proportional increase, actually it is proportional, but you don't get the same scaling, if you like, in terms of the volume as you do with the surface area. So the cell becomes bigger in terms of volume, but it doesn't proportionally become uh, the same size in terms of its surface area. So that means you cannot bring enough nutrients in and you cannot eliminate enough wastes efficiently. So beyond this certain threshold, you can see that a large surface, a large cell just doesn't have the surface area to cope with the rapid exchange of nutrients um, and, uh, and, and wastes that it needs to uh, to maintain an adequate metabolism. So in the table here, you can you can see how kind of cells can overcome this strategy. On the right here, we've got a 20 micrometer cuboidal cell. Um, uh, and you can see, we're, we're thinking about it as one cell, 20 micrometers length of one side, volume 8,000 cubic micrometers, and the surface area 2,400 cubic micrometers. And then surface area to volume ratio, if you calculate this out, is, is about a third. And then if we then just subdivide that 20 micrometer cell into, into uh, one, two, three, four, eight smaller cells, and we, we half the, the length, so what we see then is that the, uh, the, the, the surface area doubles relative to the one big cell and that results in a doubling of the surface area to volume ratio. Now if we take our giant 20 micrometer cell and we break it up into lots and lots of 2 micrometer um, length width uh, depth cells if you like, volume stays the same, the total surface area has gone up tenfold tenfold increase relative to, the, to, to having just one giant cell. And so now the surface area to volume ratio for this large group of cells is 3.0. So that means we've got a, a tenfold increase in the surface area to volume ratio just by making smaller cells, even if we think about a cell of the, the same, uh, an air volume of the same uh, as we're comparing it over on the right. So that's the first thing. You've got to maintain a high surface area volume to ratio. Um, the way that you do that most easily is you make smaller cells. Now, sometimes you can't make smaller cells, and so we often see a lot of adaptations in biology to increase the surface area to volume ratio. This is common across biology. Um, is what we're looking at here are um, microvilli on the surface of cells in the in the intestinal epithelia and so the obviously intestine is specialized for absorption that means it needs a very high surface area to volume ratio so it can efficiently absorb nutrients and so the surface of the L has surface of the cell has all of these projections called microvilli and that increases massively thousands of fold over um, uh, the surface area of the cell without the microvilli. You can also think about strategies to increase um, surface area when you think about the the foldings of the of the inner mitochondrial membrane to make cristae you can think about increasing surface area when you look at um, uh, internal thylakoid membranes in chloroplast for example so lots of times where we see cells having adaptations or adaptations internally to increase surface area to maximize the capture of something um, so that's the first thing the second thing is um, uh, the limit cell size is really the diffusion rates of molecules. Now you've got a homework so a problem set on, on this kind of thing, so this, this is probably um, uh, an important discussion to think about. So the first thing to think about with diffusion is that diffusion is completely random. Um, it is determined by the initial starting velocity and direction of a molecule, but then the size of the molecule, the temperature of the, of the, the system, and the concentration of other things that the, the, the solute that's diffusing can collide with. So that includes confining barriers like the membrane, other organelles, which are obviously going to be, have massive masses compared to a small molecule, and then other molecules of a diversity of, of, of sizes, which, um, which will affect the diffusion. So this is a completely random process. You can't predict the walk, the, 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 the pattern that a molecule will make as it moves from one place to another in the cell. So we're thinking about this happening really in, um, in, uh, in, the, in the cytoplasm. So that's everything that's outside the nucleus and outside the organelles, but inside, um, inside the uh, plasma membrane. So 
many, 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 many types of molecules and ions move around the cytoplasm purely by diffusion. Uh, and so this, as you know, is just the unassisted movement of a molecule from a place of high concentration to low concentration. Um, but all molecules will be diffusing. When we think about going from a high concentration to a low concentration, that's a net movement. That means, on average, things will move from the high concentration to the low concentration until we reach equilibrium, the things will still be moving around. Things from the low concentration will be moving over to the high concentration area. So this is random, eventually we'll come to equilibrium unless we do some work to maintain this disequilibrium. So this diffusion process is completely random. Now, as the molecule gets bigger, diffusion rates drop, as temperature drops diffusion rates drop. So there are a number of factors which influence um, um, uh, the rate of diffusion. So slow diffusion rates are going to hamper you biochemically. If, if you need to get substrates into a certain place in the cell so that you can uh, perform some biochemical reactions and you're relying on those substrates arriving by diffusion, something with a low diffusion rate is going to be uh, problematic. So as you increase the volume, you can now pretty easily see that it's going to take longer for, for substrates for biochemical reactions to diffuse around the cell. And if you think we have volume increases as a cube function, whereas surface area increases as a doubling, then as you double the kind of diameter, if you like, it's going to now take things three times slower, and then we double again, and there's another three times slower. So increasing volume means that by getting bigger means that you cannot do biochemistry fast enough in the cell for the cell to maintain the adequate metabolism it needs for survival and or growth. So cells have strategies to overcome this kind of thing. Uh, you, you've heard about microtubules uh, being used to carry uh, cargo around the cell. Other molecules are involved in active transport processes of uh, molecules around the cell. Um, and then there are processes such as cytoplasmic streaming, and which is called cyclosis in plants. And if you ever looked at an LODA down a microscope, it's the, uh, the, the kind of the pond weed you use in general biology on labs to look at cells. Um, you can often see the streaming of cytoplasm around the nucleus and around the large central vacuole. Uh, and that speeds up the movement. And so that's, um, that's a fluidity movement that's generated in the cytoplasm called cytoplasmic streaming. streaming. So there are ways to overcome this. There are adaptations in cells to, to, to increase the effective diffusion rate. Um, but by and large, you can't get too big because you can't move things around fast enough just relying on diffusion. Uh, the third thing uh, that limits cell size is related to this diffusion problem, and that's obtaining adequate concentrations of reactants and catalysts for, for chemical reactions. So um, if you think about this cell on the right-hand side here, that's a bacterial cell, and it's much smaller by and large, about two micrometers in length relative to this animal cell on the left, which is now much larger, let's say 25 micrometers. And so its volume is disproportionately large to compared to its surface area when we compare it with the, the bacteria. Um, so this means that you've either got to get much higher concentrations of reactants and catalysts into that cell, catalyst being enzymes, um, or you've got to have some strategies to make sure you have very high concentrations. So for a reaction to occur, you've got to have the reactant, uh, two reactants, let's say, they've got to come together, so they've got to collide, so that's a function of diffusion, and then we've got to collide them, we've got to react, we've got to, we've got to put those two things, those two substrates together with the enzyme, and so we've got to get these two substrates and an enzyme together, and if we're relying on diffusion, if we've gone from a small bacteria to a large eukaryotic cell, this is problematic. So um, if you increase the concentrations of the catalysts or the substrates, reactions go faster. That makes intuitive sense up to a certain point. Um, but the more substrates you have for the reaction, the more catalysts you have, the faster the reactions will go. And so the problem, one of the, one of the problems that cells face is as they get bigger, as we go from prokaryotes to eukaryotes, biochemistry will tend to slow down. And as we will see, a slower growth rate is one of the consequences of that. These guys divide very quickly, smaller genome, smaller volume, faster biochemistry, greater growth, growth rates. Bigger genome, larger volume, slower biochemical processes, slower growth rates. Divides in 20 minutes. This animal cell probably divides in 24 to 36 hours. So how do you overcome this? So what this cell here does is it, um, it overcomes this problem partly by compartmentalization. Compartmentalization is things like having mitochondria, a plant cell, 
chloroplasts uh, this cell and plants has Golgi hydrogen um, uh, peroxisomes lysosomes all kinds of structures which allow us to concentrate reactants so that biochemistry can occur and the other thing about compartmentalization is it allows you to specialize as well mitochondria specializing in oxidative phosphorylation we get all those substrates and all those enzymes in, in one place they're not just diffusing around the cell so those organelles of of, of most eukaryotic cells aid in the accumulation, the concentration of substrates and in the, in the specialization in particular parts of the, of, the, of the cytoplasm of certain biochemical reactions. Um, so make sure you can kind of think about organelles and how they overcome this problem of, of cells getting bigger. Now if we didn't have these then things would grow much much slower than they already do so the, the compartmentalization helps uh, cells achieve reasonable growth and division rates. Now it's, it's easy to think about this prokaryotic cell as relatively simple and this cell here to be relatively complex and that's totally fine because the bacterial cell is, com is, is simple but compared to this. Um, some people like to say this is less evolved than this cell on the left but, and that's completely incorrect um, because bacteria are all very well adapted to many 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 ecological niches. They also do have certain kinds of compartmentalization. For example, the DNA is restricted to this region of the cytoplasm called the nucleoid. And that means that we can have DNA replication and transcriptional processes confined to a particular place in the cytoplasm. And that's usually mediated by, by um, making kind of uh, internal domains in the cytoplasm where you have specific proteins localizing due to their interactions with the DNA and with one another. Um, now if we look at a gram-negative bacteria, now that's a bacterium which has an inner membrane and then an outer membrane. And so when you have this set up, you effectively have a compartment between those two membranes in, in gram-negative bacterium. And so you have the, the, the plasma membrane, then you have some cell wall material in the outer membrane. That effectively makes a compartment, and that means that that, that bacteria can do certain things using that compartment. For example, it accumulates protons in there. You probably know what that may um, uh, that may lead to um, other bacteria. There's a bacteria called Colobacter crescentis that can accumulate certain proteins in uh, its cytoplasm and around its cell wall, which allows us to divide. So it divides like um, in a croissant or a comma shape. Um, so there are examples of compartmentalization in prokaryotes. Um, so don't think that this is simple and stupid and poorly evolved, and this is complex and smart and brilliant and wonderful. Um, Bacteria can exist in many, many, many more ecological niches than eukaryotic cells can. So in some senses, this is much more highly evolved, but um, let's not get into that right now. So we'll wrap up there. Uh, I've talked a little bit longer than I had planned to. And next time we're gonna look at a couple of organelles that we probably haven't looked at in general biology, uh, things like peroxisomes. So I'll see you next time.